Hello, everybody. Welcome back to our weekly series on, uh, oops, wrong way. Let me go this way. Welcome back to our weekly series on Introduction to the Caribbean. Uh, last week, we talked about the environment, and tonight we actually have Tropical Storm Fred bearing down on us here in South Florida, although we don't worry too much when it's only a tropical storm. Uh, so today I'm going to uh, give our 10th presentation uh, for week 10 on uh, uh, international relations in the Caribbean. This is taken, the notes are taken from chapter 3 of Owen Blewett's book, The Contemporary Caribbean Life, History, and Culture in, uh, since 1945. So let's jump into it. And so here's our outline. We're going to be talking about World War II and the impact of the subsequent to World War II of the Cold War uh, leading up to the Cuban Revolution and Cuban Missile Crisis. Fidel Castro's role. Also, there's a decolonization process in the Caribbean, which began in the late 40s and 50s and accelerated in the 1960s. Uh, we'll talk about Caribbean independence, the British Commonwealth, the post-Cold War and uh, with turmoil in Haiti, the neglect of the Caribbean, and uh, we'll probably stop about there. We'll probably be out of time. As the U.S. power in the Caribbean grew in the 20th century, the colonial control from outside the Caribbean diminished. Uh, of course, this process began in 1898 after the Spanish-American War when Spain ceded Puerto Rico to the United States. And, of course, the United States uh, started a, a naval base at Guantanamo Bay and, and Cuba became a protectorate. Uh, so Spain basically withdrew from the Caribbean. The U.S. built the Panama Canal and in view of uh, one of the uh, naval strategists of the 1890s, Admiral Mahan, the famous American naval strategist, the canal uh, transformed the Caribbean from a terminus into a major sea route linking the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. In 1910, Britain removed the Royal Navy units from the Caribbean confident that the U.S. had the naval capability to secure the seaways. In 1917, the U.S. purchased the Danish Caribbean islands to create the U.S. Virgin Islands. So here's uh, one of my favorite pictures of the Caribbean. And the Panama Canal is down right about here. By the way, there were other options for the Panama Canal, or up other options for canal. One option was to uh, build a canal up up the river into this Lake Nicaragua and then cut a canal across there. That would have been maybe cheaper. Then there was also one up here in Mexico across the uh, Isthmus of Tehuantepec, I think it's called. The Strategic Caribbean. The islands are important to the United States for a number of reasons primarily strategic. The Caribbean islands lie on major trade routes from Europe, the Middle East, and Africa to the east coast of North America, the Gulf of Mexico, and the approaches to the Panama Canal. That's, so that's the biggest reason why the uh, Caribbean is so strategically important. Petroleum supplies and other strategic goods are shipped through the Car Caribbean waters, and significant amounts of oil are refined in the area. In terms of location, the islands are close to the United States, with Cuba only 90 miles from Florida. Another reason for the U.S. interest in the region is that the migrants, that migrants are a significant Caribbean export, and many people of Caribbean heritage live in the United States. Uh, we have large numbers of West Indians and Cubans and Puerto Ricans here where I live in Miami, also Haitians, all from the Caribbean. 
For example, Miami is home to over a million Cuban exiles, many of whom actively oppose normalizing relations with Castro. Uh, that's a little outdated, actually, with, we should say, with normalizing relations with Cuba. The New York has a concentration of Puerto Ricans who are U.S. citizens and come and go as they please. Many other Caribbean migrants enter the U.S. via Puerto Rico. New York is a magnet for people from the Dominican Republic and Haiti. And many migrants from the English-speaking Caribbean make their home in the Northeast of the United States. So there's a picture of New York and a picture of Miami. The impact of World War II. The outcome was the Cold War, which began approximately in 1948. It was an ideological conflict that did not ignite into a major hot war, but there were plenty of proxy wars, of which Vietnam was one, Korea was another. There were some proxy wars in Central America. The Organization of American States, the OAS, dates from 1890, but it was, it was in 1948 that it adopted a formal charter to encourage inter-American cooperation to, and to settle disputes. It includes 32 member nations from the Latin America and the Caribbean. Cuba was an original member but it has been excluded from the OAS since 1962. In 1954, in the heat of the Cold War, the OAS adopted the Caracas Declaration, announcing that international communism was incompatible with democratic freedoms in the Americas. A major consequence of World War II was that the European colonial powers, Britain, France, and the Netherlands, were all weakened by the conflict which lead, inevitably led to them exiting out of the Caribbean for the most part. Demands for political liberalization and decolonization were in the air, and because of strained economic circumstances, the Europeans responded. So this began in 1898 with Spain, and now you have uh, Great Britain, France, the Netherlands, and also uh, Denmark sold its islands to the United States. So they're starting to head for the exit doors. Even before the war's end, Caribbean people in the British islands were demanding more, uh, a greater voice in politics. After the war, there was a gradual movement toward representative government with an extension of suffrage and local control in the internal affairs before independence. And here's a picture of the French islands which includes uh, Guadalupe and on the north side of the map. You see Guadalupe is actually nearly divided in two, two uh, twin islands. And then you have Dominica in the middle, which I think belongs to Great Britain, and Martinique's down at the bottom there. They're all pretty close together. I would love to visit there one of these days. In 1946, Martinique and Guadeloupe became overseas departments of France with full representation in the National Assembly and the Senate in Paris, in addition to elected island councils. Suspicious of U.S. intentions and expansion, the French were in favor of assimilating their Caribbean colonies. In 1954, the Netherlands and Tilly's were recognized as autonomous equal parts of the Kingdom of the Netherlands with control over their own internal affairs. Operation Bootstrap in Puerto Rico. Meanwhile, in Puerto Rico, the U.S. promoted Operation Bootstrap, a program of economic and industrial development launched in 1947. Luis Munoz Marin was the first elected governor of Puerto Rico. Uh, that was 1948, that election. He favored industrialization, realizing that the island could capitalize on low wages and low taxes. The agricultural economy of coffee, sugar, and tobacco would not support higher living standards, and uh, Governor Marine real, realized this. Marine of the Popular Democratic Party was successful and won re-election 
until leaving office in 1964. In 1952, Puerto Rico gained Commonwealth status with the United States as a free associated state, Estado Libre Asociado, which translated into an internal self-government with defense, customs, and foreign policy in the United States' hands. A friend of mine lived in Puerto Rico for a while and met his wife to be there, and uh, he talked to me many times about some of the bitter rivalry between the three different parties in Puerto Rico, one party in favor of independence from the United States, another party in favor of becoming a, a state, the 51st state of the United States, and a third group who wants to maintain the status quo. And apparently, it's, it's a hot topic down there. During the 1950s, Cuba was in a crisis involving social and economic grievances and discontent with the corrupt dictatorship of Fulgencio Batista, who had seized power in a 1952 military coup. This is uh, something I focused a lot on in my dissertation, was the role of the Catholic Church in the 1950s during the coup, uh, the, the Batista coup, and then later during the, the Cuban Revolution. Wealth in Cuba was concentrated in the hands of a few. Rural poverty and urban penury, that is, uh, urban poverty uh, were pervasive. The economy relied on sugar exports and failed to diversify. Gambling and prostitution thrived. Cuba was a tourist, lo uh, tourist destination and also a major location of uh, mafia corruption. So Cuba would become the focal point for the Cold War, a confrontation between the United States and the Soviet Union in the Western Hemisphere. In order to protect themselves, uh, Cuba reached out to the Soviet Union and asked for an association and for uh, pro military protection. In 1961, as a result of the uh, Cuban Revolution and the failed Bay of Pigs invasion, uh, the Kennedy administration initiated a new program called the Alliance for Progress to stimulate economic development in the Caribbean and Latin America and to isolate Cuba. This uh, was agreed upon in a conference in Uruguay that was attended by all the representatives of the American countries except for Cuba. The United States, acting in response to a perceived threat, tried to win support with economic assistance and incentives. The Alliance for Progress was designed as a 10-year plan to support economic development raise per capita income, promote agricultural reform, and improve education and housing and health care while fostering the growth of democracy with, throughout Latin America. The idea here is if we help lift, if the water rises and lifts all boats, then there won't be a need for any more revolutions. The United States contributed $10 billion from its Agency of International Development. The idea here was sort of a Marshall Plan for Latin America. Unfortunately, it didn't work. For one thing, the United States didn't contribute enough. $10 billion in 1961 is not at all comparable to what was invested in the losers of World War II in 1948 with the Marshall Plan. Uh, President Kennedy was assassinated uh, a little bit like a year after this uh, initiative. And President Johnson, who replaced him, was not enthusiastic about the idea of the program. And so it died a stillbirth and never really bore fruit. Which is a shame, because it probably would have prevented our current immigration crisis if it had succeeded as it was envisioned. Third World Politics. Cuba developed an independent international policy in the 1960s and 70s with the aim of becoming one of the key leaders of the third world. Cuban technicians, doctors, engineers, and teachers helped with social and economic projects around the world. In Latin America, the Cuban government supported guerrilla movements in Guatemala, Colombia, Venezuela, Peru, and Bolivia. They were quite active in trying to stir up 
conflict in the uh, Western Hemisphere. In Africa during 1975, Cuba provided several thousand troops with Russian tanks and, and to support the popular movement for the liberation of Angola, MPLA, against the Western-backed UNITA, National Union for the Total Independence of Angola. Cuban forces stayed in Angola until 1990. Uh, I've been in Cuba a few times and I've talked with a few taxi drivers that were retired j colonels in the uh, Cuban military who spent time in Africa fighting for the Cuban army on behalf of UNITA and others. In 1978, Cub Cuban troops were dispatched to Ethiopia to stop an invasion from Somalia. I don't know how I got that far back or did I get ahead. Yeah, I messed up. Where were we? We got that. Granada. In night this is a picture I think of no that's that's the Cuban Revolution. In nineteen fifty nine in Havana. In nineteen eighty three a militant Marxist group arrested, tried, and executed Maurice Bishop, who was himself a left-leaning Prime Minister of Granada, and this group took control of Granada, an island population with a, an island with a population of about a hundred thousand people. U.S. President Ronald Reagan dispatched a tax task force to rid Granada of the Marxist and restore democracy. It just so happened that there were Cuban workers on the island building an air force which raised suspicions that the air force was in, I'm sorry, the air, air, airport was intended for military purposes. It also provided a convenient justification for the invasion of this tiny island. The United States, oh, let me back up. Without consulting London, which caused resentment, the U.S. sent troops under the pretense of safeguarding the lives of U.S. medical students in Grenada. The United States would not tolerate another communist regime in the Caribbean and feared that the airport Cuba was building at Port Salinas would be used for military purposes. The incident illustrated that every Cuban island, no matter how small, is, stri is strategically and militarily important to the United States. Grenada was the last Caribbean battleground of the Cold War. There's some pictures of uh, the uh, U.S. landing Marines in Grenada. There was a movie about this that featured Clint Eastwood. I do not recall the name of it. Caribbean independence. Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago became independent in 1962. Barbados and Guyana followed in 1966. Many of the other islands became self-governing associated states with Britain before graduating to full independence in the 1970s. Uh, the Bahamas, Grenada, Dominica, St. Lucia, St. Vincent in 1979, Antigua and Barbuda and St. Kitts and Nevis achieved independence in the early 1980s. The decline of British influence. The British influence in the Caribbean has continued to decline as the role of the United States in the region has increased. Excuse me. As we have seen, this geopolitical fact was underlined in 1983 when the U.S. invaded Grenada without first consulting with the U.K. Both France and Netherlands have in general played subdued roles in the Caribbean since World War II opting to transform colonies into full partners of the metropolitan body politic. Strong economic links uh, remains between centers in France and the Netherlands and their associated Caribbean islands, which means that they're relatively more prosperous, maybe with a higher standard of living than some of the independent islands. The Caribbean neglected. Since the terrorist attacks of September 11th, 2001, the United States has been engaged in Afghanistan and Iraq, diverting attention from the Western Hemisphere. Uh, by the way, we just are 
we're just uh, witnessing the final withdrawal of U.S. troops from Afghanistan in the last week or so. As a result of the 9-11 uh, te terrorist attacks, the Caribbean has been neglected. Yet the strategic significance of the region remains vital. <clears throat> and this chapter closes with four important security issues for the Caribbean. Political stability, access to resources, especially petroleum, refined and shipped through the region is crucial to the U.S. economy. Migration from the area to the U.S. needs to be monitored and controlled. And the flow of drugs from and through the Caribbean needs constant surveillance. So that is our presentation, presentation number 10. We have approximately four or five more to go to finish our introduction to the Caribbean. Thank you for your time and attention. Feel free to put any uh, comments down below in the comments section. Uh, any suggestions, and I will look forward to reading them. Thank you. Have a good weekend.